Uh, the Calgary Police Service Cyber Forensics Unit has charged a man in relation to the Canada Creep investigation thanks to overwhelming help from the public and extensive investigative efforts. On Monday, the CPS was alerted to a Twitter account titled Canada Creep that was posting inappropriate photos and videos of women, including images taken underneath skirts. The account was believed to be based in Calgary and the images were captured and distributed unbeknownst to these women. An investigation was launched immediately to determine the identity of the individual taking and distributing these images. Yesterday, a possible suspect was identified as a result from a tip uh, from the public and extensive work by cyber investigators. A search warrant was executed on a residence in the community of Prestwick that resulted in the seizure of multiple computers, storage, storage devices, and other electronics. Investigators are currently examining multiple terabytes of data seized, including hundreds of thousands of images from numerous electronic devices that were seized incident to arrest and throughout the warrant. Officers are in the process of identifying further victims and determining what electronic evidence is relevant to this case. Officers in the Cyber Forensics Unit would like to greatly thank members of the public who reported the online activity to police as well as those individuals who identified the accused. Members of the public as well as officers who supported the investigation were integral to bring a quick resolution to this case. Anyone who has identified themselves as a victim in any of the images posted online in this case is asked to contact the Calgary Police Service non-emergency line at 403-266-1234. And I'll take some questions. Well, he'll be getting charged in the next hour, I guess? Yeah, as of about 30 minutes ago, he still hasn't gone before a Justice of a Peace to have the bail hearing. Um, so we'll know a bit more later tonight, hopefully, but he will go before justice this evening. Can you say yet how many charges and that the charges? Yeah, the charges, there are six charges right now based on three confirmed offenses. Uh, they're under the voyeurism section of the criminal code, I believe 164, 162, 1, um, which is voyeurism, and then um, the uh, publication of voyeuristic materials, which is 162, 4. Yeah, absolutely. We do anticipate after um, uh, several more victims have come forward today, along with the um, analyzing of the terabytes of data that we have, that we will have more charges forthcoming in the weeks How to do come. How you know just the three? Like, what makes those incidences chargeable offenses right now? Um, yeah, in, the, in the, uh, the quickly moving case yesterday, we were able to identify evidence from um, multiple sources, including a tip from the public, um, along with evidence in, uh, upon arrest and evidence that we collected online from the Twitter account, which we were able to match up and uh, had reasonable grounds to lay the charges that we laid. But I guess your question is, why those three? Like, do you have three specific complainants who identified in relation to those three charges? Yes, we do. We have uh, three identified victims that have come forward that we have spoken with and interviewed, and then we've been able to match evidence to their case. Is that, need that? Is that a requirement? Or uh, can, a, can you see, okay, actually, one of a woman's skirt, we don't, she hasn't come forward, but we can still charge him based on the knowledge that we have on it. Yeah, and great question. And no, it uh, will take each case and each image and video, case by case and, and image by image, and we'll go over that to make sure it meets the elements of uh, the offense under that voyeuristic material, uh, voyeurism and or the, um, the publication of voyeuristic material. And what we're doing right now is working to identify um, and resolve all the victims that have come forward and resolve their cases and give them a bit of closure and help them through their case. After that, we'll be consulting with the Crowns on the remainder of the evidence where we're unable to identify a victim and look based on Crown uh, and police cooperation at uh, laying a global charge for further offenses on voyeurism. Can you, can you expand a little bit more on the actual arrest? You mentioned it was a public tip as well as some other investigative efforts. Can you just say mm -hmm. a little bit more like Tip came in, they thought it was that person. They were like, can you just expand a little bit on more how this kind of went down? Uh, yeah, we had uh, numerous tips. Uh, the CPS and Crime Stoppers were inundated with tips yesterday. Um, some of those tips obviously had uh, greater evidence than others, and we were able to work between uh, some of the tipsters um, and uh, identify the offender. That's really all I can, can say without um, releasing too much about a tipster or the suspect at this time. Is there were some images of the suspect caught in the video that were <coughs> shared online. Can you talk about those images and if those were useful in coming to the arrest? Yeah, all, all of the tips that came in were useful. Um, and I could say that those were useful in helping us come to bring the case to a conclusion yesterday. So you could, yes? You yes. could say those, those photos of the reflex, his reflection in his face. It, they helped us resolve the investigation, yes. So we've got his
I can't really speak anymore about identifying a suspect until they've gone through the court process. Does the suspect have a criminal past? Uh, the suspect is not known to police or have a criminal past. The, so we've spoken about voyeurism charges. Mm -hmm. um, are there other charges that he could be facing, like kind of watch what he said, but the, the pursuing somebody on a sidewalk intentionally, you know, following, like there's, there seems mm -hmm. like there's other realms outside of the voyeurism that, that he could potentially face charges for. Well, absolutely, and we are working uh, side by side with the Crown on this. This has unfolded quite rapidly uh, in regards to the time it came in to us bringing somebody into custody for the offense, which was our priority in this case. So we'll, we'll start working backwards now, looking at the evidence and how each image was obtained and the videos where they are obtained and the extent uh, the suspect went to obtain them, and then we'll work with the Crown to determine if other charges can come of that for sure. Do you sense right now how long he's been gathering these images? Uh, I'm pretty confident saying years. Uh, the evidence we've looked at so far dates back multiple years. Yeah. How many people? How many women? Um, right now, we we're working with well over a couple hundred thousand images, and expect hundreds of thousands more. So, um, I would say that um, the the video and photographs of people will or typically or potentially could be in the hundreds of thousands. Do you say how long? I mean, so it seems like a lot of data, mm -hmm. a lot of images, yeah. a lot of it. I mean, do you have, can you give us a sense of just from an investigative point of view, just how shocking this is to see this much data, and how long could it take to actually go through everything? Uh, it could take weeks, if not months, to go through it, and that we really will, we really will be working backwards. Um, under new legislation, we'll be working to get disclosure out as quickly as possible on each charge as it's laid so that we can meet uh, um, a Jordan case law and have disclosure out appropriate timelines with the court case. And then we'll each, as we identify a victim and know we have charges, then we'll focus on those specific cases to ensure that we're disclosing within guidelines. But I can say, I, I believe, uh, if I'm recalling correctly from what the investigators are telling me this morning, we have images and videos dating back to at least 2012 right now. And as we dig deeper, we may find that it goes back further. But this is kind of a high-tech spin on a bold crime, peeping Tom voyeurism. Um, what, uh, as new technology comes forward that allows people like this to, to sort of do what they do, how challenging is it keeping up with, uh, I guess, changes in technology and, and ways of offenders being able to cover their tracks? Uh, it absolutely is a challenge for law enforcement. Uh, um, it's reactive type of crime for sure. Uh, we can't anticipate who's going who's gonna, to... Uh, commit this type of behavior and who's going to post it and with the evolution of technology and just the very fact that we all have multiple electronic devices and uh, means of taking video in any format in any basically in any environment um, we are contending with these issues on a daily basis so this is definitely uh, an extreme case for us here in Calgary and what we're seeing and uh, quite disturbing and concerning no doubt so um, I guess a thing to add is um, uh, as as the community sees it, we just really need the community to continue to do what it did in this case, which really helped us get out in front of the investigation and react as quickly as we did and bring it to a quick resolution. Did you say Prestwick is the neighborhood that he was arrested? Or Prestwick? Uh, Prestwick, yes. Prestwick. Prestwick. Is that yeah. in Mackenzie Town? Um, I don't, I'm not sure. Yes, yes, it's, it's in Mackenzie Town. Town. Yes. And yeah. is, when he was arrested, was that at his home or was it at just... I believe it was traveling back to his residence, yes. Is he, is it only believed that one person is behind this account? Yeah, right now we have the person that we're looking for in custody and we're confident of that. Um, as you say, the, the investigation is definitely in its infancy now that we have uh, the magnitude of evidence and exhibits uh, in our possession. As we work backwards, if we identify any further suspects involved or that were colluding to acquire this type of content to be posted, whether it was on the Twitter feed or any other types of forums that we may come across in an investigation, uh, we'll definitely be investigating them and, and uh, work hard to bring them into justice as well. Speaking of those other platforms and things like that, I mean, we even noticed on that account before it was shut down that there was numerous other accounts similar mm -hmm. to the Canada Creep account um, following or whatever you do on Twitter, right? Like interacting on yep, Twitter. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, how much do you guys begin to work with other law enforcement agencies now? Um, I mean, luckily this person had Calgary right. as their location, but how much, do, how much can you go into this wealth of, there's a lot out there now? 
Um, it's specific to what's on Twitter and what we see and maybe where it's geolocated. Yeah. Um, it, definitely, if we come across any anything we believe is uh, a criminal in nature and, and uh, has a criminality to it, um, if it's not in Calgary and we can geolocate it or we believe we may know where it is, we'll contact and work with other enfor uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, both domestic and foreign, to try and report that to them and, and help them through the case and um, ensure that it's taken over appropriately. Uh, that's a good question. I think that what we'll have to look at is the totality of, of how much that has happened in, in any one retweet or certain account that seems to be prolific, if that's the case, um, in retweeting this type of material. Um, the, uh, the suspect in custody has been charged for distributing the material, um, along with creating it, but also distributing it. So anybody who does distribute it, based on how it's done or the totality or the intent behind that, um, it, depending on the investigation as it unfolds, we may look at that. Actively watching on Twitter for these types of behaviors? Um, no, uh, the Calgary Police, nor any other law enforcement here that we work with locally in, in Canada, uh, proactively is out there conducting unjustified or unreasonable uh, surveillance or follows on people's social media to look for this type of behavior. Um, definitely, we're out there conducting online investigations. If we come across anything like this, we'll proactively start to dig into that and look into it if there's criminality. Uh, but we're not actively following social media. Uh, for the purpose of looking for this, um, unless it's been reported to us or has a known account. It, just touching a little bit on that, mm -hmm. you were made aware of it on Monday. Yep. The arrest happened yesterday at 5. Mm -hmm. So it happened pretty quickly. I'm just curious, based on you guys getting a hold of this account or, or being alerted to this account and right. how quickly it occurred, I mean, there was the reflections of the images, there mm -hmm. was the noted that it was Calgary, as Lucy said. I mean, it, it seems as though there were a lot, like this suspect left a lot of clues. I mean, is it fair to say that this wasn't like, sorry, I guess the question yeah. I'm asking is like, was this kind of, there was a lot of clues for you to find this person? Oh, for sure. I mean, um, the suspect definitely left stuff for, stuff for us behind. I think with any online case, uh, a lot of what we don't see that's happening is identity. Um, so identity is a big issue in any online case. Just because there's a picture or a reflection doesn't mean somebody's guilty of an offense right off the right off the hop. So we have to marry that up with a, um, a whole bunch of other evidence, including the technology behind it, IP addresses, and actually physically putting somebody behind a keyboard, um, and and not just making them responsible, which is what we're going to have to do in several of these offenses. Is um, if there's not a, a, a suspect that we can directly tie to an image, we're going to have to prove that that person not only took the video, but that they were responsible for administrating that account at that specific date and time to upload those images. So that's why I say when we work backwards, it's going to take some good time not to just forensically look at the evidence, but then to make sure that that person is responsible for that account at that set date and time. What message do we have for somebody who um, would be doing this kind of thing and doesn't think it would be that big of a deal? Um, what, what message would you say as a, as a police officer, as a citizen, people that uh, would uh, you know, do this other thing? Well, I mean, it's extremely disturbing that anybody would think that this isn't across the line or illegal behavior. Um, I know the public sentiment that we're seeing around this case alone um, is a lot of people upset um, about just the uh, objectifying of women on this page. Whether their image constitutes us being able to lay a criminal offense, it's still objectification of, of women and people, uh, which is wrong. I mean, and um, we don't agree with it here at CPS. It's, it's disturbing social um, behavior that we're seeing, and, and we would just advise anybody to really take a step back, look at what you're, what you're following, what you're retweeting, um, what you're Instagramming, what you're using your social media platforms, and use it for good. Uh, report things you see that are wrong, and we should be having these discussions in our workplace and our household, and um, and really letting people know what uh, what the social norm should be. Speaking to criminal psychologists all day today before mm -hmm. coming here, um, they're pointing out that it's not just the objectification of women, women but that often criminal behavior ramps up mm -hmm. in a predatory way. That he maybe was taking photos more passively, and then starts following them, and then starts pursuing in a, in a more predatory way. Can yeah. you speak to that at all in terms of? Uh, from your experience as an officer, you've seen that kind of behavior escalate? 
Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of the first questions we saw. Um, so it's a very good question and, and good comments from the people you've talked to today. That was one of the first things we looked at when we initiated the investigation is looking back in the Twitter feed immediately is when did this type of behavior start? How far back does it go? And how, how is it intensified? And it definitely did. The behavior on the account started to intensify, became more, more aggressive, I guess, um, in regards to uh, taking more chances to achieve the goal of what the suspect was doing in the case. And we look at that in every case, and that's definitely um, makes the, the case a little bit more pressing and urgent to bring to a resolution. Uh, the suspect behavior is always brought into, into uh, consideration in these. How, and just how satisfying is it to get an arrest this quickly and, and how important is it? Uh, the, the, I'll start off, the, the community was essential. Uh, they're always essential. They're our biggest partner in anything we investigate, and we do rely on that partnership for sure. Um, it's extremely gratifying for a police service and for the investigators. Uh, everybody who worked on this, and even those who weren't directly involved, were working very hard to bring us any information, whether it could have any possibility of being relating. So again, I'd, I'd thank on behalf of the CPS and the Cyber Forensics Unit, um, everybody in the community and within the service uh, indirectly or directly involved in helping us bring a quick resolution. And even given uh, the technological difficulties of investing in these types of files, if we continue to see investigations like this and have this level of participation across the board, uh, internally and externally, we will see these types of results. Anything else? Uh, what's the maximum penalty that be occurred from these charges? Uh, he, it's are proceeding by way of indictable. So again, we'll have to determine based on the totality and the extent. Um, and the Crown will help to determine what the potential uh, penalty will be in this case.